Hello and welcome to the Smart Women in Business vlog and podcast. I'm your host, Jay McKay from Jay McKay Communications, a marketing consultant and coach who works with people across the world to build the business of their dreams. Today, it is my pleasure to be speaking with Angela Henderson, an international award win winning business coach for women, international keynote speaker and podcaster who helps women in business get all their pieces in place to have consistent five-figure months and then on to six and seven-figure years without burning out in the process. Welcome, Ange. Hey, hey, super excited to be here, my friend. Thank you for being here. It's a very challenging time at the moment, but we're here. We're showing we up. Are. We're we are. We are. It is. Oh, it's choice. Every one of us have choice every single day on how we show up or how we don't show, you know, show up. There's no wrong or right way, but whatever choice you make, there's consequences, there's positive outcomes, there's opportunity. So you can choose to whinge and moan about things or you can choose to keep rocking and rolling. Again, women always have choice. And we are rocking and rolling. So tell me about your business journey so far and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, uh, I'm an ex-mental health clinician of 15 years, so I have an undergrad in psychology, a uh, master's degree in social work. Uh, I did 15 years in mental health where I used to diagnose people with schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, anxiety, etc. Uh, I worked that job for a very long time. Uh, in fact, I worked that job for uh, up until four years ago. I still was working 40 hours a week in the mental health industry while running two businesses with two small kids. Uh, that's not something I wear as a badge and honor. It's just that it works strategically for me to do it that way and not have pressure on my family. Uh, but then when my son was nine months old and I was off on uh, mat leave or a day off with him, we were just chilling. I just remember looking at the ground and he was playing with all these toys that were battery operated that had been given to us, which is fine. And yes, my kids use iPad and all that. But I just remember going, there's got to be a better way to work with kids on fine motor skills, gross motor skills, color recognition, imaginary play. And that's when I went looking for other things that wasn't available in the big kind of super, not supermarket, but like the big chain kind of stores. Um, and that's when I developed my first business, which was in an e-com platform called Finley and Me After My Son, where we focused on creating childhood memories through play, love and travel. And obviously, yeah, we started off just like everyone, zero products, zero email list, zero knowledge of anything. And when we wrapped Finley and Me up, we had an email list of 50,000, a following of about 95,000 between the so 95,000 on the socials. Um, also, and 1,400 different products we had at that particular stage. So again, we started with something and then we were able to capitalize on that. The other thing that Finley and me taught me was the importance of having multiple income streams and not being heavily reliant on one because you never know when things are going to happen. So in addition to having the e-com stuff, as I also would write for those mothers, so I'd write about the loneliness of motherhood, depression and anxiety in mothers, etc. And then they... Ultimately, it was a marketing thing, while well, at the same time giving back to these women, while well, at the same time I then was also you know, able to get paid $4,000 to write a blog article for, say, Spotlight, um, who then would then they want my audience, I was able to create something in that. So it was really great. I worked with Netflix as one of the top 30 bloggers and influencers in Australia. And again, it just allowed me to have another income stream. So yeah, so that's where the first kind of business journey started. And then over two months and about 14 different coffee dates, and I soon realized that people wanted to pick my brains. And I thought, oh, I can't do it. Keep doing these coffee dates and, and 30 minutes there and 30 minutes back. And I realized, oh, if I charge people for my expertise, I could have a secondary business. So Angela Henderson, and consulting was never something that was on my vision boards or my goals or anything like that. It just kind of organically and authentically started to unfold and blossom. So we've tied up Finley and me and now predominantly, yeah, I work with women all around the world in startup stage, growth stage or scale stage to help them, yeah, get all those pieces and the how to's. Um, and there's no blueprint because every woman that I work with is very different based on their family needs, how they learn, um, how they communicate, what their goals are and what they're in alignment with. So, you know, it's, it's very important that we figure that out for individual women. And yeah, so now my, my main goal is to get more wealth into the hands of women. Awesome. Shared goal there because it's interesting um, how so many of my guests on this show, we talk about getting wealth into the hands of women and now money has become something that women are becoming more and more comfortable about talking about and owning and mm. being realistic about if there was more wealth in the hands of women how different the world would be 
Mm-hmm. I mean, well, the data shows that that's not like something that just like women are saying this. The data shows that the more wealth you get in the hands of women, the more change comes because women contribute more wealth back into society than men do. That's not like a made up figure. That's like, go look at the data. Right. So, again, if more women can start to change their family and then their community and then, you know, from a, a national point of view and then from a global point of view, again, yes, the world will look very different. Mm. I'm looking forward to that world. Yes, absolutely. Uh, (laughs) So obviously Angela Henderson Consulting has evolved Mm -hmm. since its inception. So what were the signs for you that it was time to change? Because often we go into business with an idea that this is what we're going to do. And you said it wasn't on your vision board, but probably I'm guessing because this is how vision boards do you usually work is the outcomes that you had on that vision board have been facilitated by Angela Henderson Consulting coming to life. But what? I mean, yes and no, I would say yes. I mean, I think that there's obviously big things to be able to live my dreams and do all that. But the, sometimes I think women are looking too much for the how to's. How do I do this? How do I do this? Versus allowing things to just if that happen. And, and one of the things specifically over the last three years, when I've gone through some different healing journeys and modalities that I've had to, because a lot of a deaths in my family was the reality of it is, is I've had to detach from the how to's and I've had to detach from the outcome. It just is what it is. Mm-hmm. And I've had to really lean into that. The right people who are listening to this podcast now are the right people. Um, the right people who consume my content on my own podcast are the right people. The right people who show up into my programs are the right people. So often we're trying to control everything and and maneuver everything versus just going if you genuinely believe in divine timing right that the divine timing for those who don't know is that the belief is that is everything in our lives is is it happening at exactly the right time then life will be okay but people aren't trusting themselves they're not trusting the process so for me it's something that i've really had to let go of is the detaching myself from the outcome and just embracing the world as it is so it was never really thought out planned. It was just like, yes, I want more money. I want to help more women. Uh, the how to's weren't necessarily there because I knew that they eventually would evolve in front of me the way that they need to. It's um, trusting the process is such a, and letting go of the control and mm-hmm. pushing through and forcing things to happen is such a difficult concept um, mm. to get your head around when you're in business because you're trying to control everything all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of your journey, what were the triggers that it was time to change tack or change products or, you know, change how you deliver and show up? I mean, learning the notion of alignment, mm-hmm. right? Learning the notion that, you know, a lot of people are on the, you know, you've got stress, then you've got burnout. But if you think about burnout and if you think of an equal line, you are in alignment, everything is in line. The further from alignment normally also is a direct correlation of burnout. Mm. So whenever I say to people, you're, you know, I'm burnt out, I'm burnt out, well, no, you're unaligned. Mm. So once I started to figure out where I was unaligned, I was able to let go of certain programs or certain offerings or whatever, because again, I was trying to chase the dollar because that's what you're taught and that's what you're consuming on, on social media so often. But once I let go of that and found like what lit me up, what excited me more, uh, the evolution just kind of unfolded within itself. Because again, energetically, I then was, do you know what I mean, in alignment. So therefore my energy was working for me, not against me. So I do encourage women to be thinking about it. And same when I work with my clients is, what do we keep? What do we let go of? One of an easy little task you can do is when you go look at your calendar, if you go look at your Google calendar right now or your Outlook calendar or whatever, whatever the fuck is weighing heavy, get the fuck rid of it. But yet people hang on to it and they hang on to it because that's their primary money source and that's it. I'm not saying just let go of it and have no money. Don't, that's just dumb. But what I would be saying is at least acknowledging that this is heavy, this no longer serves me mm-hmm. and start looking at a strategic exit plan. So how do I get rid of this product or how do I wrap things up with one-on-one clients if they're too heavy? And what can I do in exchange of that that will still bring me in the money that I need? Mm-hmm. Uh, but too often women just keep holding on, keep holding on, whereas I'm just kind of like, learn to let go of what's no longer serving you Mm. because we're always in alignment with something it doesn't Mm -hmm. necessarily feel good Mm -hmm. 100 and that's again so so many times when i start my initial onboarding calls with clients it's the first thing we look at Mm. what what 
what parts of your business do you hate and why? Sometimes we just hate doing admin work. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean we're not aligned, but that typically means there is, is that's just not our skill set and we need to outsource, but it's when it comes to like the day-to-day delivery, Mm -hmm. again, if it's starting to weigh heavy, you're going to have bigger problems and you're going to remain stuck inside of your business because the energy that's associated with everything is heavy and negative and toxic. So it's up to you again, to take responsibility and start really leaning in and looking at what's going on in your world. It's so true. It's such a big, <laughs> it's such a big conversation in just a few sentences, really. It's um, incredible how I'm the same when I work with my clients. The first question is, who do you want to work with? And they go, well, I work with these people. No, not, not, those people who do you want to work with is often a really big gap between the two and it's because we're told we should deliver this thing or we should work with these people or these Mm -hmm. people have got the money whatever Mm -hmm. that's not who you should be working with the people you want to work with are the people you want to work with and trying to find bridge that gap is normally the first step I take with my clients Mm -hmm. there will always be people out there who are willing to pay you Mm -hmm. But first, you have to believe that yourself, right? You know, I won't name names, but there's this a coach at the moment who is doing phenomenal work, doing amazing things. I've looked at doing some coaching with her. To work with her one-on-one for the year is over a half a million Aussie dollars. Yeah. Now, that's not the right fit for me right now. Doesn't mean I have any other words for her, right? But there are people paying her right now I think she's got, well, she's got a wait list also to get into that program, but you're ultimately paying. Well, no, that's different. I mean, you're paying a shit ton of money, like what, almost 50 K per month to work with this woman. And that people are doing it, right? Because again, she believes in her product. She believes in what she does. So again, 100%. So it's like, there are always people willing to pay you, right? But you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to believe that the product that you have is going to deliver for those people. And if you don't believe it, people feel it. 100%. I mean, that's why when I when I hear people say, oh, just increase your prices. Well, no, not, it's not necessarily that easy. Because when people told me to increase my prices, I mean, I started off coaching charging $100 an hour. And now I charge $12.50 an hour. Mm-hmm. It didn't happen overnight. But what happened was, is also I've spent almost a million dollars on professional development in 11 years. So what happened was, is when I, when people are like, oh, you need to charge from hundred dollars to 500. When I started to do that, I couldn't close a sale because I wasn't in alignment with it myself. And I wasn't able to literally, I would get to close and I'd be like, uh, 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 it's $500. And then people are like, what the fuck? Right. And I didn't close a sale, didn't close a sale. So what I had to do was go back and incrementally start to increase it. So it was like 100, 150, 200, 250. And every step I started to feel more empowered and more confident and build more belief in myself. Right. And now I'm literally like, if you want to work with me for a two hour strategy session, it's $3,000. You don't want to, I'm okay with that. I will not hard sell anyone. I will not say nothing. It's literally, if this feels right, let's do it. If it doesn't feel right, I'm not going to say you're a bad person or you're not ready to invest. No, Mm. you get to make the decision. You're right on time. Yeah. And I'm really, really, um, I've seen it a few times now. I get really angry about people um, shaming people into not having the money. Mm -hmm. That is incredibly toxic. Um, and I'm seeing it in the coaching space at the moment, but we don't have to talk about that. No, but no, it happens. Like no. I literally say to people is I never want to be the conversation over dinner that Angela Henderson's payment is coming out. Yeah. Yeah. This should not be a stressful exercise. This should feel good because as soon as you enter into something, we're already energetically off. Mm, mm. Right now, don't be wrong. Like I just paid $45,000 to work with a coach for six months. Mm. I took that out and put that out on a PayPal loan because I like to keep a certain amount of money in the bank and I don't want to put it on credit. But that was a decision I made because I also knew that that 45K, I would I would get that back in investment, right? Yeah. But people also have to understand that it's not just about the money. So when people sign up for me, some of the first red flags they'll say to me is it's like, well, how much money will you make me? I will make you $0. Yeah, you, you'll make it. Because your success and your failure comes down to your action or inaction. 
my role is I will show up and I will give you different strategy and I will help you get an alignment. I will help with your mindset. I will help with you any connections. I'm very well connected around the world. I will do whatever I can, but it's like, I can only lead the horse to drink the water. I can't make you drink the water. Mm. And I know I repel a lot of people when I say that, and I'm okay with that because they're not ready for me yet. Yeah. Doesn't mean they're bad humans. It doesn't mean anything else. It, it just means that they're right on time for where they're at. And it's not the right time to engage with me. Mm. Again, if you go back and believe divide timing that the right people are presenting in your world at the right time, then you shouldn't have to hard sell. Exactly. Because the right people are showing up, leading from a place of abundance versus a place of scarcity. Oh, that person never went back from. That's on them. That's yeah. not on me. Nah. I showed up for the discovery call. I gave the recommendations, right? That has a lot to be said. But I also think women, the one caveat I will say, and we have measures in place to do that where I call a little bit of bullshit on women. And this is where I think women have a tendency of uh, blaming men for a lot of things, in my opinion, is that the one when I hear, I just need to ask my husband. Mm. Okay, remember the pre-qualifying question that said, is there anyone else that needs to be on the discovery call? And you tick the box that says no. Now, there are some women who, yes, need to speak with the partner, men or female. I get that. But own the space. I'm not ready yet. It's too expensive for me, right? This isn't not the right fit. Own it. Mm. Because this is how I believe women continue to perpetuate the cycle of not having wealth is they start scapegoating. Men do this, men are shitty, got to do the link. The husband, how do I know this? Because I've asked multiple people. I'm in masterminds where I just have males in the mastermind. And I said to the guys, how many times have you been on a discovery call with someone and said, I just need to speak with the missus? Mm. And they're like, never. I never have said I need to speak with my husband. Yeah. My business, my path, my responsibility. Now, again, there will be some, but that is going to be a minority. And so, again, it's about women taking responsibility, stepping into their power, understanding what works and what isn't, and being confident with owning that. Mm -hmm. Because, again, if you are wobbly and can't say to someone on a discovery call, we're not the right fit or it costs too much or whatever, then I'd hate to see what's going on in business. Yeah. Right. And so it becomes a knock on fit. So I said, there's always caveats to everything. Um, because again, I do believe people are, everyone's right on time, but you, no need to lie and no need to scapegoat. Right. Yeah. There's also a big difference there too. Like I was going to work, like I said, with that particular woman. And I just said, thank you so much for your honesty. I, it wasn't even, I didn't even say about her pricing. Good on you for charging this, but it's not the right fit for me right now. Right now. Yeah. Right. But, and that's it. But I let her I at least have the common decency to let her know where we stood, thanked her for her time, et cetera, right? Mm. But I didn't scapegoat. I need to speak to my husband. And my husband said no. So again, I know it's like a little bit of a deviation, but I think these are the conversations that are important because I'm very much about changing the culture around women and women being able to own their own voice and being okay with that and stepping into that. Right. 100% agree with you because it's not, you are in your own destiny, mate. Mm, 100%. Don't, don't bullshit your way out of it. Just either say yes or no. Don't be dishonest. Mm. Now, you, this leads me, sheer honesty, you wrote an incredible article um, last week or the week before about managing your life as an entrepreneur, which caused a bit of controversy. So please tell us how you manage your life as an entrepreneur, Ange, because you've yeah, I mean, been listen, for this. Which I, I mean, listen, there's like... Oh yeah. Controversy. It was, I mean, listen, it's a highly emotive topic. So whenever you start talking about money, it's highly emotive. Mm. And so I knew that article was going to go down with maybe 90% of the overall population. So I knew going into that. So let me give you that. I knew because most women's mindset is hanging on to limiting beliefs, trauma, and the nine yards. So I knew, only, I, but I also believed that again, the right people, the universe would present that to the people that needed to hear it and make change. Mm -hmm. However, what I didn't like was a very well-known feminist in Australia, which I won't name names, who decided to make assumptions about my family and I, that then put it out to an audience of 400,000 where she was doing it for clickbait. Mm. 
that's the problem I had with that particular article. And I'll go into the article in a minute, but that's the problem I had. I had no problem with the article. I have a problem when people make assumptions and then I've got to get a lawyer involved. And then I've got to do you know what I mean, because there's a law here in Australia that you are responsible for every comment on your social media outlets. Yeah. So when they're saying my husband's a waste of space, my kids are fucking deadbeats and a whole bunch of other things because people made assumptions, that particular person, that's not cool. No. So the article that was talked about was that I pay pretty much about $1,400, give or take on any given month to outsource my home life. And so I also find it, so outsourcing means I've got a house manager that works with me for a couple hours a day. School holidays are slightly different. She might work for one day to the next and then take the work off, whatever. But theoretically, she works about eight to 10 hours a week for me. She comes into my home in the mornings. She'll help tidy up the dishes because uh, my kids will undo the dishwasher. The kids have already fed the dogs. Like, yeah, so those people are saying like they're not going to have any life skills. No, my kids still do plenty. Um, but the that allows me not to be rushed. It allows me to slow down with my kids in the morning. We can play board games. We can go for a swim in the pool if we want. We can chill. Whereas before I had help with Paula, everything was like always constant. Go, go, go. Get in the car. Get your lunchbox. And it was a fucking shit show. Where and are I don't your want- socks? Yeah, I don't want I don't want that. Right. That's a choice I make. I also found interesting that some of the comments is like the average human can't afford that. OK, well, maybe they might not be able to afford. So I pay Paula thirty five dollars an hour plus. Um, what do you call it? She's a casual. Plus, I got to pay her super. Do you know what I mean? All that. Plus, she gets like bonuses. Um, the gardener that comes is this kid. Right. I pay him thirty five bucks to do the lawns. That's his, that's what he offered. Right. So he comes and our lawn is very, it's not like we have a huge acreage or something. It's very small, um, et cetera. And so those people who are commenting about outsourcing in the home, again, it comes down to choice and priorities. We don't eat out as much. We, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. I don't smoke. So I also don't buy fancy clothes, not because it's just, it's just not in me. So I choose to buy back my time so I can have more memories with my children. Now, for all those, when I say there would have over been 10,000 comments, there's literally over 10,000 comments. And I'd say 90% of those were derogatory um, or toxic. Some of those people would drink a slab of beer a week. Some of those people had more tattoos and that's okay. But each of those tattoos would have cost probably at least a thousand to two thousand dollars. Some of them had profile pictures with fancy BMWs and Mercedes. It's all about choice, right? And it wasn't even with Mercedes. Again, you've got choice. So if you want to get home help, even as a single mother, where can you cut expenses to free that up? Because yes, I have Paula 10 hours a week, but you don't need Paula 10 hours a week necessarily. You might need uh, Paula to come every fortnight for two hours, and that's $40 a week. Well, if you cut back on your cigarettes or your drinking or your shoes or your purses or your clothes or your cars, anyone, in my opinion, can find an extra $40 a week if you choose to. Netflix. So Netflix, All Amazon, yeah. Prime, like there's that many things. Don't have your coffee for a couple of days and drink coffee at home. Like there's a variety of ways if you choose to, but that comes from people with a different mindset, in my opinion. And so, yes, I got slaughtered. However, I've had of the slaughtering, I've had many people still reach out thanking me and Angel, I've hired a cleaner and I've done this. Thank you so much for having this conversation. So again, the right people will have received that message accordingly. Yeah. But also women have been told not to have these conversations. Women have been told to just, you sit back, you're a woman, right? And so again, because it's still so new to our society, that women are asking for help, right? And that's ultimately where it came down to is when I was at my lowest with anxiety and depression on days where I did think about killing myself, I knew something had to change. But again, you then had the guilt. Oh, I'm a bad mom. I'm a bad woman. I'm a bad wife. I should be able to do all these things. Who who has defined that society for us? So not only is money a highly emotive conversation, but it's also a cultural disruption that we're having to have because of the stereotypical roles that are being played in society. So again, uh, the shift is there. And that's why, again, I'm, I'm happy and will continue. My word of the year is impact. I will continue to have these conversations because those people who need them will hear them and receive it and those who don't won't. But 
even for those people who might not be ready to receive it yet, they could, I've planted the seed. So they might not do anything with it now, but it could be 10 years from now where they've had enough and they're like, oh, I remember that article at one time, right? So again, uh, it still has impact. Yes, well, you're, you're, I thank you for putting that out there because so many people need to hear it and lose that mum guilt. We're not here to do everything for everybody all of the time. And we're not yeah. here to be present for everybody all of the time. And if you can buy back your time, even if it's just for you, not necessarily for your kids, mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. Just do it. And don't feel guilty about it. Easy said than done. <laughs> 100%. So what does a great day in the office look like for you? Because obviously you're, you're, you have different products and ways you deliver to your clients. I mean, listen, first off, I mean, I think it's important that I have ADHD. So though there can be the best of intentions and best of plans, it's again, if I'm in a hyper-focused state, what was initially on the agenda could be shifted to something else. Um, but theoretically, Mondays, uh, I don't see any clients on Mondays. I do discovery calls Monday afternoons, and then I meet with my team Monday morning. It's more like a CEO kind of half morning day. Tuesdays and Wednesdays are always fairly full on because I've got my one-on-one -on -one clients, my mastermind clients, my accelerator clients, or my everyday payday clients. So that's Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Thursdays are on my business. So to, like at time of recording, today is a Thursday. So I'll do podcasts, recordings for either a guest or my own podcast. Um, I might take the day off if that's what I want, but go get a massage. I could be working on a new product that I'm releasing. Like it's, it's kind of like really whatever. It's more about having the flexibility. And again, it wasn't always like that, but I had to start making choices. So whenever I look at my year in action, for example, the first thing I do is I block out all the school holiday dates. I block out all the public holidays. And then I go and put in all my own holidays to start with. So that's how I do it. And then my working on my business. So theoretically for 2022, I have 77 holiday days booked and that's not including the other Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and then again, I, I work around it. So like I said, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are full on. Like I don't have, I, and I have a lunch break every day. So I do schedule that from 12 to one every day um, to get up just in the sunshine, just to move from the desk. Uh, so yeah, so it's, there's never a uh, pretty concrete, it's pretty loose, but Tuesdays and Wednesdays are my busiest days of the week with client work. Yeah, which is fun. I love it. I find mm -hmm. it really energizing. Um, but yeah. So I, I have it blocked into two days as well, and it's uh, it might mm -hmm. change this year. So what yep. are your favorite tools? Obviously, you've got a team that help you be productive in mm -hmm. your business. Yeah, and so we predominantly use uh, Airtable. We use ClickUp. We use ThriveCart. The portal I use is a portal called 10X Pro. We use a scheduling tool called Agora Pulse. Um, I mean, those are pretty much our key our key players that we utilize in regards to making things work. Uh, obviously, Gmail we use. Uh, yeah, those would be our main tools. I'm yet to interview anyone who says, yeah, Microsoft 365, man. Yeah, no, no, I would say no, unfortunately. <laughs> no one's ever said it. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Shout out to Google. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> totally. So... You're incredibly honest in your socials and I'm obviously in your group. Um, so I sort of know the answer to this question, but I'd love you to expand mm -hmm. and share with all the women across the world. So one of the things that affects every single entrepreneur I know except one mm -hmm. um, is imposter syndrome. So what are your methods to overcome this if it still occurs? Um, and how do you respond to the bad days of being in business? I mean, imposter syndrome, I mean, for those, just to clarify, is really about referring to the book, refers to, you know, believing mm -hmm. that you are not as competent as others perceive you to be. Which is a hard one. I guess there's a couple of things. Is one is when I first started in business, failure has never been an option. And imposter syndrome, though it might come in, like I'm trying to think of examples where it's way heavy 
similar. I don't think it's really ever impacted my world. And that's not trying to be cocky or a douchebag or conceited or anything like that. But I think because my mindset's pretty solid and I'm pretty confident and because I came in with the attitude that failure is never an option, I've never really let imposter syndrome get in my way because that would mean that I'm getting letting the, the thought of failure get in my way. And so the really the thing is, is it's like, again, I've just had to learn to believe in myself. And, and it's always been a trait that I've pretty much had. Right. It doesn't say that I don't have bad days, but I've never really let imposter syndrome or failure be two, two words or two part of my vocabulary. Um, It's just not an option. So am I going to fail? Absolutely. Do I make mistakes? Absolutely. But those failures are, 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 AKA those mistakes that we have is um, they're, they're the path. They're the guide to what we need to do. So we don't do it again. So I look at every mistake and or failure as a lesson that is needed to get me to the next spot. So because I reframed that very early on, it's like, okay, well, you can either take what that lesson is giving you and not do it again, or you're going to keep repeating the same problem again. That's on you, right? So again, mistakes and failures, reframe that, but these are the lessons I need to get me to where I'm going next. And so when I say failure is not an option, what I meant is like failing my businesses was never an option because I believe is what Marie Folio talks about is everything is figure outable. When something doesn't work, you try something else. And you That's add it. an element of divine timing to that. It just is, it's working it's for you. Like it's, that. and I generally believe that the universe is working for, for me, not against me. And I mean, in the last few weeks, as I, again, there's been a variety of things, but it's, I mean, even if you think about in the last three years, my grandmother died on Christmas. My brother died on Mother's Day. Uh, my father type figure died on New Year's Day. A friend died two weeks after that. A best friend just died a year ago. Um, you think about the hate that I've had over the last few weeks with media blowing up in regards to me outsourcing in my home. I lost my Instagram account just recently. Luckily, I got that back. Uh, we've been having to deal with crazy neighbors because we had to take a tree out. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's, I, and so, but not once did I say, not once generally did I go, why me? Yeah. Why is this happening to me? Poor me. Don't get me wrong. I felt sad, obviously, when my brother died, and I still do. I feel sad thinking about the loss of my grandmother. But I just knew that the, the this is the way the world works. So it's it's not that I haven't grieved and it's not that I don't continue to grieve, but it's just the way it is just going like this. And this isn't about the world having anything to do against me. The world is giving me exactly what I need. It's working for me, not against me. So the fact, again, and another quote that I often talk about is whatever you are, whatever you are not changing, you are choosing. Mm. That whatever you're not really- changing, you are choosing. So rock solid mindset I mean mindset is key again my core thing when people work with me is is strategy sales and marketing and accountability and when I infuse my trifecta together I help women make more money but it doesn't mean that I don't I mean all my programs come with a mindset monthly mindset coach access to monthly or uh, one-on-one sessions with a mindset coach but they've got access to my healers for example they've got access to energy healers also like there's uh, energetics there's a bunch of a variety of modalities though I don't teach it and it's not my zone of genius hypnotherapy etc I still highly recommend those other tools in order for women to get to where they're at And there's no doubt that my revenue increased by almost $300,000 last year by, by the hypnotherapy sessions I did, my healing sessions I did, like all of those things, because your external world is a direct reflection of your internal world. So if you're looking at your bank account and it's in the red or it's not where it wants to be, that's on you to figure out the messiness and to get to the root of the problem. Because you've either got money blocks, you know, subconscious beliefs around it. You've got imposter syndrome. You know, the so yeah, there's seven kind of main mindset blocks that I see in women in business. And one is self-trust, the belief in yourself, your growth, and your integrity. The second I see is self-love, the sense of one's own value or worth as a person. The third that I often see is this worthiness, the quality of uh, being good enough. The fourth I see is around money stories and blocks. Again, those negative subconscious beliefs about money that are limiting women from making more. Obsessive thinking, that series of thoughts that typically reoccur, often paired with negative judgments. The divine timing, the belief that everything in our life happens at exactly the right moment and imposter syndrome. So the more of those mindset blocks that I just mentioned you have, the harder it's going to be for you to get to where you want to be. Yeah. Wow. Um, How do you maintain your sense of community? That's powerful. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, my community, community is always being a big part of what I do and who I am. 
I'd say if I had to admit the last year, I've probably been a bit more disconnected than what I normally would be. And that's, I mean, and when I say that people are a bit shocked because they're like, oh, we don't think that, but I would feel it. I don't feel like I've been as present. Um, and that's only because, because I've done so much healing this last year. So I really had to step away and make some hours in my life to do a little bit more of my own internal work. So that's probably why I feel like I'm a bit more disconnected though others may not, but community is key. I mean, I am where I am today because of my community. There's no doubt. And, and I don't just mean like my community saying my women in business, Facebook group of almost 10,000 are Instagram or whatever. Is that like, I've paid to play meaning I've paid like, you know, to work with my current coach, 45 grand to work with him for six months. I'm paying to get into his ecosystem. I'm paying to get connected with his people. You know, I've spent almost, it would be almost 750,000, probably closer to a million dollars in 11 years of professional development. I've done that because I want to be sitting with the right people at the table. I want to be the person who's the dumbest person in the room in order to be able to grow the most and accelerate the most. But I equally want to be able to give back. So it's not just about creating my sense of community for the people that I have in with my own ecosystem, but it's about broadening my own community and putting myself with the people who are already where I want to be uh, and just, yeah, putting my hat at the table. So, you know, people are always like, oh, I can't go talk to this person or, oh my God, I, you know, I, people say that to me and I'm like, well, that's bullshit. Like I literally... When I would go to events and I would see big names at that stage, Pat Flynn, bunch of people, right? I literally would walk up and shake my head and say hello. Yeah. It was never that they were better than me. It was no, we are equal. You're just further along than where I want to be. Denise Delafield Thomas, you know, she's one of my good friends now. And I remember seeing her at an event just three years ago, I think it was. And I just walked up there and I said something like, you know, I'll be a millionaire one day. And she's like, yeah, you know, she's Denise. And yeah. she's like, yeah, now we, you know, we text message or we talk all the time. But Denise is way further along even now than me. I mean, she had over a $4 million a year, right? Yeah. Which is fantastic. Um, but it was never that they were better than me. It was always and, that we are not. equal. And if anyone treats you like that, then they're not 100%. but it's not even sometimes I think people think that they're being treated in a certain way when actually people are just being them that comes down to your mindset again and your perception right it's skewed by your mindset right 100 so it's like you know I got to speak on stage a few years ago with Pat Flynn Omar Jordan Harbinger a whole bunch of them and I've known those guys for years right we then hung out in a mansion together for three or four days just hanging out right played board games got drunk just whatever like we were just everyone was on the same playing field mm. allow yourself to pull up a seat in anyone's table even if you don't have the quote-unquote knowledge that they might or that you're not further along mm. oh, I love it so what what keeps you motivated in your business I mean, listen, my biggest motivator, as I say, is like my kids are part of my why, but they're not all of my why. Mm -hmm. My motivator is obviously to get more wealth into the hands of women. But my biggest motivator, my biggest why is to make sure that I break the transgenerational patterns between the women in my own family. And so um, my grandmother didn't speak to her mother. My mother didn't speak with my grandmother and I don't speak with my mother. So with my daughter, Chloe, I know uh, statistically speaking and I also know just from day to day as I work a million times harder on that relationship with my daughter than I do with my relationship with my son mm -hmm. and so it's it's a big my push every day is also about showing Chloe and, and equally showing Finlay that again as a as a mother I can leave and that the father can step in right that for Chloe is that she can see that you can still be a good mom and you can still be a woman in business and ultimately you know, again, that really that big drive to make sure that I've got space to work on that relationship with my daughter is huge because, again, I want to make sure that I've got a relationship with my granddaughter or grandchildren one day and that this pattern stops with us. Yeah. So I'd say there's a combination of things that keep me motivated on any given day. It's um, <laughs> the pressure of being a role model. How do you think that plays out for women with daughters, especially? Mm. I mean, I think it's daughters, but I think it's also equally our responsibility to remote all our to our sons. Yeah. Again, you know, the pre-COVID, I would travel internationally four times a year, easy. And again, people would say when I get to these events, because I would be one of the few who had small children. Typically, I would be hanging out more with men or I'd be hanging out with women who were more like in like wrapping up. So their kids were like 16, 17 are already kind of off. Do you know what I mean? Like empty nesters like and stuff, right? Where you and I are. 
Yeah. And so I was, I would be there and I would be the youngest one there. And they would say, oh, your husband let you come. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> no, I made the decision to come. Or gosh, what do your children think? Well, my children, them. yeah, like it was all these things, right? And so I had to make sure that, and that's why I often talk about it when I'm at speaking events and things like that is that my children are part of my why, but not all of my why. And that I had to learn very early on that you can have both being a good mother and also being a good woman in business. And that again, what this has allowed me to do is to show my son that as a father, if he chooses to be later on in life, that it's okay for his do you know I mean, male partner or missus, do you know what I mean, to go and do things and for him to step in because he is a sperm donor at the end of the day. Um, but for my daughter to realize that again, there's no reason why that she only has to do one or the other. Now she can choose. If she wants to be a stay at home mom and that's what she is. She's passionate about awesome. But if you want to do both that you can have both. So to me, it's a constant role modeling. Um, about that, you know, I also have to talk a lot about my, uh, with my son who's 12 about money, right? Like his, his perception about money is very much about oh, only doctors and lawyers and those typical jobs uh, make X amount of money. I don't like to talk too much about what my hourly quote unquote rate is with my son because he's got a bit of a mouth that travels very far and wide. But one day, again, you know, I, I wear a hoodie, I wear flip flops, I wear gym shorts. This is like how I show up on my own stage. This is how I show up on podcasts. This is how I show up on any given day. Obviously, if I go to someone else's event, it's their space. So I will dress accordingly, but pretty much this is how I am. So his assumption is that because we only drive, you know, a 2021 Outlander, for example, and not the Mercedes, we're poor. His perception is that um, doctors make more. And so one day he said something, he wanted to go to this private school that was 40K and I refused to pay for private schools because back home in Canada, what you guys call state is just as good as private. So I choose to not spend my money on uh, private schools. But his assumption is that, well, that means we're poor. He doesn't get that. That's just a choice, choice. that we're making. Mm -hmm. So one day he said to me, well, such and such as dad is a lawyer. And they said they make X amount. And I said, oh, and they can afford this. And I said, oh, okay. I said, what if I told you I made double than what that dad does? No, you don't. Well, why would you think that mom doesn't make that? Well, look at how you dress. Look at how you do this, right? And I was like, well, mom makes double what that person does. And he, he was pretty much speechless, right? Because he was then processing, right? Mm -hmm. So again, there's a lot of conversations that I have to equally have, not just with my daughter, but with my son, depending on what comes up for them. Um, and yeah, it could be money conversations. It could be about respect for women. It could be respect for males, uh, respect for female and male roles within the home. It could be about duties and responsibilities. There's always uh, conversations that can be had if you choose to. One of the best ones, though, is, is when I knew... A few years ago that my kids have probably heard too much about entrepreneurial world <laughs> is we were on the farm in Tassie at my husband's parents' house and they uh, make money through bailing and cows and things like that. So he said to Jean, my mother-in-law, um, Nana, how much did you get for those? How much do you get for each of those bales? And Jean said, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. And Finley said, well, you should Nana, because it's your business. And so at that stage, I was like, oh, okay. And then he said, but Nana, so how much do you get for each bail? And she's like, I think about maybe $90. And he's like, you think or you know? And she was like, ah. And then she looks at me and I was like, I got nothing here, right? And then he said, but that's not true. You don't actually make $90 because you have to pay this guy, the bailer. And how many hours is pop out here? And then he says, maybe you need to reassess your business. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh my God. Right. So clearly they listen to conversations. And that's the thing is it's important to for them to not only listen, but it's also equally important to get curious about their own thoughts because Already, I can see that my son would have money blocks, right? Subconscious beliefs around money. And so it's my responsibility, in my opinion, to make sure that I'm starting to break down some of those barriers and beliefs so that he understands. We went to his new high school here in Brisbane orientation a few weeks back. And the principal, again, I don't believe in all of you Aussies, private, private public, whatever, where you got to wear uniforms. It's just, I don't grow up. I'm, it, it goes against every grain in my body, but out of respect for the school we've chosen, of course, we'll respect the rules. But the principal for his year said something that in order to be successful, you have to dress for success. And I'm in the back in my flip flops, my hoodie, hoodie. and my uh, board shorts. And in that particular moment, I personally looked around and people were in ties and suits and heels and whatever. 
So we got in the car with Finley and I said to him, and Chloe was there too, I said, let me make it very clear. What you wear does not equal your success. And so again, even there, I'm having to start having conversations because I could have let that go. I said, in my opinion, you're wearing this school uniform to understand rules and guidelines and boundaries. And these things will help equip you for later on in life. But what you wear does not equal success. There's a bit of a difference. And he's like, oh, he's like, I didn't really think about it. I said, you may not have. But it's those comments that they hear that accumulate over time that stems from their limiting beliefs and it's on us to break those patterns mm. wow that's really interesting comment because that's just anyway snobbery i don't know mm. sorry but again but in cult in our culture is it's been ingrained in us that you dress for success yeah. i've had coaches myself say if you want to get to the next level you're going to have to start dressing for the, the role and i said well then i'm probably i said i'll be i'm i'm 100 okay to stay at the revenue i'm at if that's what needs to happen mm. now i'm not saying that i'll never not go and maybe when my kids are older and i have more time again choice because and, and I, I caught myself there because I there's always time if you choose to make it a priority. I don't make doing my hair and makeup every day a priority. That's and there's nothing wrong for those who do because that's important to them, mm. right? So I want to make the clear: there's no shame or no guilt. But for me personally, that's not a priority for me right now. I'm not saying that it's never not going to be a priority, but I never want my outfits to have to be a direct correlation with my revenue because yeah. you either like me for who I am or you like me for who I'm not or you don't like me I'm okay with that and I don't think that there should be an element of the physical in a business relationship it should be always the energetic mm -hmm. it's it's strange and I mean my clients get to see me in all sorts of um, weird and wonderful outfits, especially before we had aircon and I would rock up in my bathers, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are your top tips for all the smart women in business across the world? Uh, everything's a choice. Everything's a choice. Listen, I'd always still say lead with value, right? Mm -hmm. Leading with value, I think is key, but stop chasing the dollar. When you lead with value, you can still become profitable, right? Uh, I do believe that conversations equal connections, which equal conversions. So again, where else are you having conversations on a daily, monthly, fortnightly, whatever basis? The more conversations you have, you just increase your overall profile and connectivity. And again, that will lead to conversions. Uh, and I would say pay to play. Mm. There is not a single person I know who's making seven, eight, nine figures who are not paying to work with coaches and consultants and healers and hypnotherapists and a variety of other people. Mm. It takes a team and it's not just a team of your doers or your admin team. It takes a team of people around you to get you fit in your mind, fit in your body, fit in whatever in order to get you to that next level. So pay to play because when you pay to play, uh, there's a notion that I say is when you pay, you pay attention. Yeah. And I believe the transformation occurs when the transaction takes place. Ooh, I like that. That's so, yes. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Angela. Um, oh, thank you. How can listeners find out more about you and your work? Yeah, I say always just head to my website, which is AngelaHenderson.com.au. And from there, you can choose to listen to my podcast that's been going for almost four years. You can join my Facebook community. You can learn to work with me. Or I also, again, luckily enough, I've got my Instagram account back. You can always head <laughs> to Angela Henderson Consulting over on Instagram too. I'll put them all in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time today, Ange. Gosh, thanks so much for having me. You have an awesome day. You too. See ya.